you're now live says the computer so hopefully that's true um well welcome guys to a, a very special facebook live today um before i introduce you to uh two amazing and very special guests today uh, i just want to uh, take a moment to say that um when it comes to contributing to racism in this country um i am uh, i'm at fault you know, and I'm not, like the only person, just to be clear, <laughs> you know, um, and I am to blame. And, and so I, I want to take responsibility for for two things. Number one, what I've done to make the problem worse, um, often unconsciously. And secondly, what I have not done to make the problem better. And so I feel like, um, you know, when you compare where I'm at to where people were a lifetime ago, which means last week on social media, uh, you know, that I'm late to the conversation, but there's actually a reason for that. And so uh, before we jump in, I want to kind of address the question, why now? You know, why not last week? Um, well, there's, there's a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, you know, I mentioned, uh, I feel like I've contributed to the problem. And the honest reason, as I shared with Brian and Mary before, is uh, to be brutally honest, I just didn't care about the problem. Really didn't care didn't affect me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, much as I don't necessarily know or care if there's a tornado in some small village in Sweden tomorrow, you know, it didn't affect me. So I didn't care. When I started to care, however, I, I have an aversion and this probably affects me from a marketing standpoint, but I have an aversion to um, just jumping into the topic du jour. You know, my my default is to kind of sit back and see how things play out. Mm -hmm. And um, during that, there was a video that I watched by, by a guy named Eric Thomas. He's a he's a pastor. He's a motivational speaker, and he was talking about uh, how you know the Montgomery bus boycott back in I want to say 1962. Um, from the time that basically Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat until they changed the law on buses, not all of civil rights, not, you know, desegregating schools, not ending the Jim Crow laws until black people in Montgomery, Alabama could ride a bus just like anyone else. That was all they were fighting for. And they did it for 381 days every single day. 381 days of black people and white people, for the record, walking to work, carpooling to work, getting home late, um, missing their kids' dance recitals, you know, sacrificing and, and, and disciplining themselves, walking to work in the rain, walking to the work in the cold. Believe it or not, it does get cold occasionally in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, you know, walking in 105 degree heat. You know, they have a term for that in Montgomery. It's called spring. You know, 120 degree heat comes later and they discipline themselves for 181 days or uh, no, sorry, 381 days, 381 days. And so I didn't want to come in on this as part of the topic you door, post something and feel like I had done something when, you know, so many people sacrificed for more than a year just for that one little thing. So when we talk about the bigger thing. I hate to break it to everyone. It probably ain't going to be 381 days. It's going to be a lot longer, but I'm in it for the long haul. At the same time, I didn't want to wait 381 days to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super grateful for my guests today. Uh, Mary Mitchell and Brian Arnold. Um, they have listened to me. They have, um, they've allowed me to ask some bold questions and uh, even some stupid questions, you know, some ignorant questions actually is probably the word I would, I would use because um, there was a lot of ignorance. I would never say I'm a stupid person. I just was ignorant about a lot of things uh, for educating me and, and most importantly, for encouraging me to be a voice for positive change, including this today. So, Brian, Mary, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So, as you guys can tell, Mark and Robbie aren't on. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I am doing, I was sharing that with you guys like I don't even know where the controls are. So if you guys uh, can put just put something in the chat. Uh, let me know you're here. Let me know where you're from. 
and I think that'll let me figure out what I'm doing in terms of controlling um, comments and things like that. Also, if you guys have questions, um, I, I do not want to be the only one asking questions. Uh, I want you guys to be asking questions. Um, and I, questions I might not even think to ask. So if you have questions for Mary, you have questions for Brian, you have questions for me, um, you just have a question in general, you know, about race and the problem and the solution and whatever else comes up today, uh, please drop those in. So my friend Darren, it is good to see you. Um, so this is one of those things, Brian and Mary, I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> You got it's a it. tough one. It's a tough subject. It's a tough I subject. Know. That's so, just all there is to it. Um, and yeah. I, want to, yeah. I want to do more listening than I do talking today. I would, I would I do, yeah, I would just go ahead and just add add to what you're saying as far as I don't I, I don't think I think we all are have a, have a, a responsibility of uh, where things have been at because to be honest, I think black white. Asian, whatever, whatever um, color you're in, there's, there's been maybe some ways where we all been a little despondent about what's been going on. You're thinking everything's mm -hmm. okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe all of us aren't doing enough. You know, um, maybe, maybe a lot of us didn't, didn't vote last time. Maybe a lot of us, you know, maybe a lot of us think that everything's okay. Maybe those times when things were, weren't going well in, ba in Baltimore, what were we all doing there? You know, so so I think we all bear some responsibility in in this thing where we're 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 not doing enough. We're not saying enough. So I don't, I don't want you to think that you're bearing that responsibility on your own because that's definitely not the not not the truth. So I would say definitely we all have shared share that in some way. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. I we all share that responsibility. We have all been complicit in one way or another. Hmm. That's a uh, interesting word, word choice there, you know, uh, but accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, um, I know I don't bear the responsibility alone and, and the fault alone, you know, and clearly, uh, especially when we look at it in a historical context, you know, um, you know, I was born in 1979, and so my starting point was different than someone who was born in, you know, 1859. Yeah. Um, my my starting point for what defines racism is very different than it was 100. Even you know, somebody born in 1969 or 59. You know, uh, even like the, my dad's. Yeah. You know, it's it's that, that's a plus, and that's what I'm saying. Like when we were talking privately, one of the things I I, I observed. And it was ironic that I observed it and then I was listening to something recently and they documented something similar. This tends to happen in roughly 50 year waves. You know, we made massive progress under, um, you know, President Kennedy and, you know, Martin Luther King and, uh, and LBJ. We kind of just really, I think we parked the, pardon the pun, but we parked the bus there for like 50 years. And and now today, or we're even like 60 years today, I think we're making massive progress forward. Um, I guess the reason why I want to do this now and I want to continue the conversation is I just don't want to park. I don't want to park the bus in July. You know, like, OK, George Floyd, we made progress. Black Lives Matter and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I, I don't know. That's that's kind of why I wanted to do this was just I don't want to park that bus there. So. And unfortunately, if if people don't continue these conversations and the conversations start at home, they start at home at the end of the day, that's exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be something else that comes up that's going to take priority and everything that has happened is going to be put on the shelf. And we're going to focus on that other situation, but we have to keep it at the forefront at all times in order to make that significant change. I mean, a, a major systemic change is what needs to happen. And once we do it in our homes and then we take it to our schools, our churches, our you know, medical institutions, any institution and to our government, then in maybe 672 days, we'll see something different. Yeah. So for those who are watching now, and if anyone feels this way, let, let me know. You know, if you're kind of like me, uh, just drop a note in the comments and let me know this. Um, 
we want to make that massive change. What's the first thing? Like, what's the do this in the next seven days action that we can take? You know, in marketing parlance, we call that what's the quick win? You know, what is like the one page cheat sheet PDF that we can give people? You know, <laughs> they can make progress and they can feel like they make progress because that's human nature. And I think. I think this movement or any movement, if it denies human psychology, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, I think like we're dealing with changing people's hearts and minds, not, you know, getting them to release a, you know, start a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, this is like life and death. I mean, literally life and death type stuff. But still, what are the quick wins that people can get in the next seven days that are going to start moving the ball down the field societally? Brian, would I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, first we said conversation, that's one thing. But then I think not letting things go, as we see people are talking about, you know, the um, the Confederate flags are still being up. We've kind of just let these things go. I think right now we're like, not let, we shouldn't be letting these things go anymore. Th these are things that affect people, you know, in a very profound and, and deep way. So it's about now, thinking that now we should be able to, we should be taking more care about what these uh, these things are, are happening around us and, and be more aware of it. So what else can be changed? <laughs> you know, what little things can be changed so that we all understand it, so that we all are, are taught in, in, in different ways. So I think education, 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 for sure. And I think that doing it in a way where it doesn't, you know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of us sometimes are afraid that, you know, will this affect my family? Will this affect my money? Will this affect, you know, how is it, how is this going to affect me if I, if I go out like this? I think, that, I think that's a, a, a very, a very big um, important thing that we all are afraid of, <laughs> you know, if I go out like this, how, how will I be received? So I think that if we all are kind of, figuring it out together, I think that's the, the, the very first step, you know, mm -hmm. what can be changed together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I wanna, I wanna come back to that question, but can I, can I ask both of you real quick? Cause you brought it up, Brian. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt Mary, but mm -hmm. you, you mentioned, you know, the Confederate flag and the big thing, of course, I think it, I don't know if it was literally today or yesterday that it happened, but you know, NASCAR, like they originally like three days ago, it was, well, we're going to discourage it. And we're going to do like the flag exchange thing, but they came out and said, no, we're going to, we're going to literally ban the flag because of what it represents, you know? And it's not about whether or not it represents it to the person holding it. It's about what it represents to millions of other people, you know, just for the record. Uh, that's my stance on that. And I'm going to shut up about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is like, how big of a deal is that in the, in the scheme of things? And I'm not diminishing it. I'm just asking you to as, you know, as people to whom that is an, an offensive icon, like how big of a deal is it that an organization like NASCAR said, no, we're no longer allowing that at our events? Mm -hmm. It's a big deal because people are holding on to old traditions and, and old, old values. Yeah. Um, as long as that's, as long as that's there, it represents old values, it represents hate, it represents um, um, not inclusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in, in, in it's, it's, it, it feeds into the minds that, and, and it continues to harbor that into the generations and generations. So we want to stop that generational curse that has happened with that. Is there, uh, some, someone told me that is there any other, any other country that does this where we hold on to um, these old barriers the way we are? You, you don't see in Germany, you don't see people bringing up stuff from from the, from the Nazi times. You know, it's just not there because they don't want that particular value anymore in their country. We should be doing the same example, even more so um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. And my brother and I were having this conversation last night. And basically what is happening is the, the closet racists are coming out. This, this has opened the door for, for people to come out of the closet. And it's happening. People are posting on social media they're posting different things that you're finding out their true colors. And, and as my brother even told me, he's like, I have to find a new merchant to take care of this that I've been going to for years because everything on social media 
that is being spewed is negative. And I never knew that that was the way that person really felt. And so now I'm questioning whether I've been getting a fair price all these years, or if I, you know, if I bring, if I bring this thing in again, will I get a fair price? So now I need to find a new merchant. And it's like, yep, I, I totally see what you're saying. But I think going back to the question of what, what's a quick win, you know, one of the quick wins for me, obviously, is what I'm always preaching about is it starts in the home. Identify your biases and your values and where where are your beliefs coming from that make you think that it's OK to be complicit, to not not fight for what's right or to allow behavior to happen and not say anything. And then some of the other things that you can do is um, join a group join a group that's advocating for the rights of, of of people of other racial denominations other minorities just volunteer and that will get you to know other people and you'll understand them from a different perspective and then another thing is to just go ahead and, and do your research you know look for different perspectives by reading different things and really understanding what the cultures are about so there's something that um, I, mean, I love that, like, again, identifying your biases and values. It's again, I always, it's just the way my mind works. Everything kind of goes back to marketing. You know, it's yeah. like, well, what's the first step? What's the quick one in marketing? Identify your customer, you know, like just, just know who they are. Mm -hmm. You can't create a product or a lead magnet or anything until you know who the customer is. And you can't really know, um, can't really know what you're educating yourself on uh, in, you know, without identifying the, the biases and values. So there is something that Susie just popped in the chat and then I want to address her, her comment actually. But uh, yeah, I did a terrible job of introducing you. <laughs> I said your name. I uh, got, got that part right. So, you know, at least people aren't like, there's two random people in here. What is going on? You know? um, so, Brian and Mary are both in our Start Mastermind. That's a mastermind we have for beginning online entrepreneurs and uh, you know it, to intermediate online entrepreneurs. And it's an amazing group. We meet every single week, every single Wednesday, and uh, we just we talk about business and we you know how how I can help them and how we can help each other in the group. Uh, everybody has a hot seat and all that. No, it's, it's not about Start today, so I'm not going to too much about that. But last Wednesday, um, about I don't know if I even told you guys this, about two minutes before we got on, I made the decision. I was like, no, this is something we need to talk about as a group. And, you know, the reason I chose that group as opposed to just say, hey, let's just go on Facebook and talk about it is like, it's a safe group, you know? And um, I, first of all, it's what was going on in the world and not addressing something that big as a leader of that group would be a mistake. But secondly, um, I had questions. I had, I had questions. Like, I just was like, I said, first thing I said was like, guys, I don't know what I don't know, you know? And, and we had a really cool conversation for an hour um, about this topic as a group. And it was really cool to hear other people's perspectives and, um, you know, to ask questions, to you know, answer questions that uh, different people had of me. Uh, but that's how I know um, Mary and Brian, they've been uh, contributing members of that mastermind for a while now. Um, and, uh, I'm not going to, I'm, I, I'm just going to say they're rock stars, <laughs> like the action they're taking and what I'm seeing them do and what they're saying in the group has, has been amazing. So, um, Susie, that's how to answer that question. But she, Susie also said, I think that the George Floyd situation has been a catalyst for conversation and action like none other in recent history. Yes, ma'am. Uh, why is that in your opinions? I mean, what, what is it? About, this isn't, I mean, sadly, this wasn't like an outlier, you know, like, wow, we never knew this was happening. We've known it, I would say, at least societally since 91. You know, uh, I can honestly say that before 91, people might not have known this, that this type of thing was happening. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they didn't, but I'm like, I didn't. I was 12, you know, I, mean, I didn't know what was going on in the world. Mm -hmm. I was worried about baseball cards, you know. Yeah. Um, but at least since then, we've known this was happening. And then we have cell phone cameras at mass for about eight years now. This isn't the first one. So what was it about this one? So if I can, if I can address that first, Brian. 
So Susie, just so you know, um, I am actually an advocate coach and I work with people that are currently experiencing or have experienced workplace discrimination and want to change. I've been doing this field of work as a in coaching for several years and I bring experiences of actually being discriminated against for a number of years in the workplace. And so I'm uniquely qualified to, to speak on, on, on that piece of it. Um, as, for, as far as the George Floyd situation being the catalyst, his situation was the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm -hmm. Like it just, that was it. People, the fact that these, uh, that this officer had his <clears throat> knee on the back of this man's neck and this man was crying out for his mama and he was saying repeatedly that he couldn't breathe and there were bystanders that were trying to stop it by telling the police officer to get off and you know check on him and he, you know he can't breathe i think when all of that happened it just it exploded and it was the straw that broke the camel's back hmm. people said enough enough is enough Brian, what, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I agree with, with what uh, Mary was saying. It was, it was, it was, it's, it's built up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, I was, and I, I think I said this in the group um, the, the other day, just like, I have been kind of desensitized because I've seen it so much. But then just a string of incidents in this last year um where you're seeing history repeat itself sometimes you read these things but you haven't seen these things so you're seeing people out you know in their trucks with 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 um rifles or whatever they had coming out to shoot to kill somebody that's not something that you see or, or, or want to see in these things and times and you, you've read about it, but you haven't seen it. You haven't seen somebody not care about a person's life. They care more, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's out there. The visuals were so impactful. And I think that's why we're like, people are like, you know, oh, we see that now. We see that, we see that over and over again. And it's undeniable. So it's like, you, 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 we're thinking from the years past that these were going to be isolated incidences, but now you're seeing that they've ramped up and they haven't stopped and there's not really a sense of change. So I think this last time has just been something has to be done. So I think it's just been built up, like Mary said, built up. So we have to say something has to be done for the future of everyone, mm -hmm. of all races. You asked me when we spoke last Friday, Mary, you actually asked me what it, what was uh, what was it about this personally that you know, that touched you made you want to change a difference and um, you know I, I was honest with you and I told you that um, I feel like again from my perspective from a you know upper middle class white man's perspective, um, there was always, before George Floyd, there was always a yeah, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know the stories. And so if I get the stories a little bit mixed up, I apologize, but <clears throat> with Michael Brown, you know, there was the, if I'm not mistaken, he actually did do something wrong and there was some there, there were conflicting eyewitness accounts and it was one of those, yeah, but, you know, and it was a, it was a, yeah, but, and the truth is, I, as far as I know, we don't know 100% exactly everything that went down and it's not out of the realm of possibility that he actually did do something that, you know, led to his, his death. I'm not, again, I, that's not the point of this. I'm just saying there was a, yeah, but, um, with, with some other cases, there have been, you know, at least from my you know, upper middle class white man's perspective, there were yeah, buts. What did this for me was there was no, there was literally no yeah, but in this situation. Mm. And, and so I was not left with 
the I was not left with the perspective of, well, when you break the law, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. I was not left with the perspective of when you run at a police officer with a gun, <laughs> because even as a white man, I'm not going to run at a police officer who has a gun <laughs> on him. You know, um, the, you know, the, w when you do that, th th that's what happens. And there was none of that in this situation. And I just remember, um, Mary, I would love for you to, to share your perspective on that. One of the things that kind of made this so particularly bad for you, because you asked me if it was this and I said, no, I, it wasn't, but it was the, it was the circumstances. And it was like, for the first time it, it, it hit me that the only explanation, the only explanation for this was evil. You know, I mean, th there, there is no other explanation. There was no, yeah, but, you know, and I, I just, you know, I was telling my wife, like, again, we don't know all the circumstances. The cameras didn't come on until a certain point, but if he did do something wrong, then what, what he deserved was to be handcuffed and put in the back seat of a car and treated like a human being. Mm -hmm. And if I, you know, I think about if I had done what, so this is where it goes back to, again, you know, if I had done what he had done, you know where I would have been? I would have been sitting on the sidewalk mm -hmm. at the worst. And I shared with you guys that back in the fall, uh, I got pulled over for going 46 and a 35. And you know, that's breaking the law. And I had I mean, the officer had every right to, you know, under the law to give me a ticket. He didn't, you know, that's not the point. The point was I pulled over and at no point, at no point in that transaction did I fear for anything. I mean, there, 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 it never even crossed my mind mm. that this was going to go south in any way. Mm. In fact, when the officer pulled up, I made a joke, you know, we talked, my kids asked for a sticker <laughs> and he gave me a warning mm said have a great day and it was like my heart I, I don't i don't even think my heartbeat increased you know because the worst thing that was going to happen to me was i was going to have to pay more insurance mm -hmm. i wasn't going to be beaten i wasn't going to be mistreated and i sure as heck wasn't going to lose my life that day because of speeding mm -hmm. um, and so that was it for me it was just the the, the pure I, I don't i don't know like i I, I don't know what else he intended. I, I truly believed at that point that he had, and there have been arguments about this, but that's not the point. I think he intended to kill him. I don't know how you can be so, you, he either has to be the dumbest human being alive oh. or a blatant racist who intended to kill a black man. And I'm, because if, if it's the former, how do you not, I'm not a, I'm not a medical expert. He probably is because cops are trained in that stuff. You put pressure right here long enough, it cuts off the blood flow, it cuts off the breathing, and it kills somebody. Um, and so I was just like, that was what did it for me, was that, and then seeing how systemic that is. Um, but Mary, there's something you said about that video that I just think is important for people to hear, um, that I've gone back and watched it since and saw what you were talking about. Uh, could you share that? Just yeah, Absolutely. So what really, what really got to me, and I mentioned earlier that he was, you know, F Floyd was calling out for his mom while Chauvin had his knee on the neck. The look on Chauvin's face when the, the camera was pointed right at him, it was one of indifference, one of no caring, and it, it was just there. And that's, that stuck with me. Like that is the image that I have of this whole situation is him on, on the back of this man's neck looking at the camera like so what it's like who cares it was just very callous and i just i've not been able to let that image go and you know i have a brother that is three years younger than what floyd was at death and all i could think of was that could have been my brother hmm. that could have easily been my brother because they're in the same age group and would i have wanted someone doing that to my brother and would I have wanted the person looking so so callous and cavalier I wouldn't I'd be angry and I think 
that's an important point, Mary, because people who look like me don't think that way. I, I'll never have that thought. No matter how much education I get on this, I'm never going to have the thought mm -hmm. that that could have been my daughter or my son. Mm -hmm. There's evil out there and, you know, bad things could happen to them, but that, that won't. I, I have no doubt. I mean, there's that's not a, that's not a thing. And, um, so I know that one of the things I've uh, we're speaking of children here on that on that note that um, something that I think I knew it happened. I'd heard the term, you know, the phrase "driving while black." I, it's not like that didn't exist somewhere in my vernacular. I'm not so sure I believed it was true. Mm -hmm. I think I thought, no, I acknowledge that I thought that that was the use of the word here, but it trumped up. Um, <laughs> I don't know of another word, sorry. Um, you know, what happens when you elect a president whose last name is a verb, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I kind of thought it was like a trumped up thing. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I don't really know how to explain that. But um, Brian, you shared with me, I mean, just the, the sheer number of times that you've been pulled over for, like, I've been pulled over a grand total of three times in my life. You know what I was doing all three times? Speeding. <laughs> <laughs> that's called driving while, or that's called, you know, driving while speeding. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, it's a real thing, isn't it? Yeah. What? I spent a lifetime being pulled over. I mean, pulled over. I'm not a criminal. I have never been to jail. I've never been, you know, convicted of anything or that kind of, nothing like that. I've always I have been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I mean, uh, I've been, multiple times just driving and i mean picked out amongst I'm not just randomly I've, I've been picked out in traffic to you're the person we want to pick out and 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 and, and stop i've been there several times in my life and it's you get to a point where you you are sometimes expecting it or like expecting to get stopped which is a sad sad thing to say but you walk behind, you walk and you feel like you're going to have to be able to talk, you're going to have to talk to this per, this cop for some reason. And that's built up even to this day. That's a real feeling. That's not fake because it's happened to me over and over and over again. I, I, like I expressed before, I was stopped in a matter of two weeks, in, in, in two, you know, twice in, in a matter of a two weeks period. Amongst many cars, they stopped me. So it's a real thing driving while black. It's not, it's not a pretty thing to say, but it is a real thing, unfortunately. And I have three black sons. So I fear all the time that something like that could happen to them. So outside of me, outside of myself too. So yeah, it's, it's a real thing. So as a parent, there's, there are things that you as, as, as parents of children who are going to grow up, um, you know, hopefully not, but I mean, right now, I mean, how old are your, your kids? I know your, your daughter, Mary is. My daughter's 26. I have a 32 year old and a 30, 30 year old. Maybe it's 33 and 31. It's one of those two in their thirties, one in their twenties, 26. Yeah. Mine are in my um, mid twenties. And your in yours, Brian? In the, they're in the mid twenties. Yeah. I mean, so they're, you know, they're nine years, you know, plus into, into that. Um, I mean, and I'm imagining you had to start having those conversations with them a while ago about, you know, how you interact with the police. And just to, just to give you some perspective, these are not conversations that I'll ever have to have. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is going to change in this world that will ever make me have to have that conversation. What we're working towards is where... You know your kids, Brian, and 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 your kids, Mary, don't have to have those conversations. It's 
I just want to be clear with people. We're not working towards a world where everybody has to have that conversation. This isn't, you know, bring someone down so that we're all, you know, on the same level. It's lift people up so that we're all on the same level. Um, I, I, this is, I kind of, kind of just say this, this is really bothering me. Um, like that just, I don't, Okay, so let's. I want to just focus there on the on the. This isn't about police or not police or just. You know, I know this yeah. is like systemic, but like, do you guys have any opinions on or or, or know of? How, how does that, like, how is that okay? I know it's not, but like, how do we stop that from being okay? What is something that can be done? that just that would would even if somebody even if a white police officer has you know racist thoughts would make them not do that because it's just not okay is is, is that a thing i mean i don't know like i i literally i'm asking you guys because i that that's really bothering me right now to be honest i i think like i said education and i think the going through the point where if this is done, if you if you cross the line, that you will pay the consequences. Because right now, they're up to this point. I think they're in the in this mode where I can do whatever, and I'll be I'll still have a job. I'll be okay because I'm enforcing the law. So this I think the education has of of of, of what's happening here has to be instituted for real, <laughs> in in some way. Because right now it's just like. I'm enforcing the law, you know. I think I think we get to this point where we're like, maybe we're too desensitized to seeing all the action films, or whatever. Where the, they 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 do whatever, they take the law into their own hands, and that's what's happening. So, I think yeah. you know we just got to change that. Education. Well, you look at even when when the the riots were first happening, and even after George. Floyd was, you know, shown on television and he died, you still had police officers in other states, other cities that were doing, you know, similar behavior patterns, um, being aggressive, things of that nature. It's like they're doing their job. And, and don't get me wrong, I have, I have a cousin that served as a police officer for over 30 years in Dallas. I've got really good friends from the military that were military police and not all police officers are bad. They really aren't. Um, you've just got a few that just don't understand how to have compassion and they probably watch too many action films and they thought, well, oh, this, this is the way I'm supposed to do it. Who knows? But the, the conversation with, you know, us having to have with our children, people that look like me, that conversation with our children has been happening since way before I was born, because we have to teach our children. We have to teach them, you know, you have to look a certain way. You can't do this. And Susan, I see on your post. And first, let me let me offer you my condolences for the loss of your brother. I'm really sorry that you're having to go through that. and There's still no justice. And you are absolutely right. Justice is required. Um, but and I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, Welcome to my world. Yeah, right, right. To right. Uh, <laughs> that is one thing we all have in common. <laughs> yes. I lost my train of thought there. I'm so sorry. But no, everybody deserves justice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and like these police officers, there was there was a story that came out of Texas where there was another individual that died that was heard recorded saying, "I can't breathe." And yet, you know, he still died and he died right there on the scene where he had been, you know, stopped. So until the police are properly trained and and no, you know, they can't keep throwing money at, you know, I know the military throws a lot of money at EEO training and posh training and, you know, all this kind of training to, to do sensitivity and everything. But unless it's practiced in reality, it, it doesn't do anything that that training it just it doesn't it's of no value to anybody and so there has to be some kind of sensitivity training cultural training um 
that really allows people to understand what is it that you really go through. And one of the things that, um, that I feel needs to happen in these conversations is they need to bring people like Brian who, who can t attest to this is what has happened to me and this is how it has impacted me so that people can really see it, feel it, and embrace it. Um, I'm a mother of two boys myself, and I, not a day goes by that I don't worry about them. And even though they don't live in the same place as I do, every day I pray for their safety. And if I don't hear from them within two or three days, I'm on the phone. Hey, you need mm. to let me know you're okay. Because I don't know what's happening. I don't know if one day I'm going to get that call that my kid was was killed or I'm going to see it on the news like that. That's traumatic, like very traumatic. Um, and people need to get an understanding and, and talk to others to ask them, what have your experiences been like? What have you experienced? I really want to know. And after you shed tears and after you, you know, you hug it out you go and take that and you do something with the information. And so when you see someone, whether you're at work in the street and you see them being mistreated, you now have a focal point and you have something that you can go and say, you know what, that is not okay. And you need to stop. But we've been conditioned to, mm -hmm, not my problem, not my problem. Nope, nope. Let me not say anything because then it's going to cause trouble for me or it's going to cause me to have to disrupt my day because now I'm going to have to sit at the police station and give my statement. And so people just keep on going. And I think that's why we have gotten to a place where we're at in society now, because so many people are afraid to come forward or it's an inconvenience. Yeah. I just want to let people know that all of my experiences are not from police. I can tell you right now, there was a time when I was at a convenience store and I I was waiting with my with my friend. We were both black, waiting on the car. We wait for somebody to um, to help us direct us to some some other place where we, we were going. And the person at the convenience store called the police on us, said that we were loitering. So my experiences are not just with police. It's with yeah, everybody. Right? Yeah, it's so, with everybody. It's just that they have, I mean, both white and black police officers, Asian police officers, right. whoever they yeah. they have. They have the power to pull you over, right. you know. Like, right. and uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, <laughs> you know, and and that's why. I mean, my, my hypothesis, and I, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know what the statistics show. I, I think the police are just a cross section of, mm -hmm. of of society in terms of beliefs. I think there are, you know, there are racist uh, police officers probably in no greater proportion to the police force than there is of the, of. Um, you know, of the, uh, of the population. I think, I think the difference is somebody like me where I was, you know, and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you, uh, I've shared a, f a few examples, but like, you know, uh, one of the examples, it was kind of this, um, I don't know if you call it unconscious racism. It was just something I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought was racism was like, um, and, and I, I'll just, I'm going to just say this. Nothing I'm saying, um, I, I, as I said last week when we spoke, I, I sincerely hope none of these things offend you. I'm being honest and transparent, and that's a very dangerous place to be sometimes. Um, so even as I'm saying these things, I'm a little bit on the nervous side. Mm -hmm. But I would say something like, well, you know, that Mary and that Brian, they're very well spoken. Mm -hmm. I would never say that about a white person. Mm -hmm. It's there. Then, and, and here's what I here's what I acknowledged about that. It's not a compliment. Mm -hmm. The insinuation is you're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I get that all the time. I would never have thought that. Mm -hmm. And so, my my thought is with regards to the police, and I know we want to move on from that because it's not everything, but. Mm -hmm. My thought is there are police who had the same views that I had, but what's, what's the old saying about, you know, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. That kind of thing is that if there's that, if there's that seed of racist thought, but now you have power and now you are, because I've, I've heard it said 
you know, this is true. Um, police have to deal with crap all day. And guess what? They deal with crap from white people. They deal with crap from black people. They deal with crap from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, but if you have that seed and then it's germinated and it's watered by, you know, the experiences they go through and then you give them the power, which they have, um, their racism comes out differently than mine did. Mm -hmm. Well, you yeah. look at you look at what happened shortly after there was a retired Navy um, captain or admiral. I don't remember what the rank was, but mm -hmm. he was in the comfort of his own home behind closed doors with his wife, having a conversation, just the two of them. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, he didn't realize that he was also live streaming that conversation um, with his phone, which was in his pocket. And it really captured the true essence of who he was because he was using very derogatory language and he was saying some very bad things about the african-american community and so that led me to do a little bit more research and look into how many other people are doing this and you know you've had stars i mean i've had two of my favorite stars that i like to watch on different shows they've been terminated because of things that they have said on social media that shows what their true colors are and you know and, and i've always told people you know, like when the whole thing happened with that MSNBC reporter when um, Kobe Bryant died and she was accused of using the N-word on, on television during the show. And she says, no, 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 no. I got I got the Knicks and the Lakers mixed up and it came out as Nakers. Um, when people inadvertently spew something like that, even if it's accidentally, it's because it's what's deep within them, because it's how they talk at home. That's what they say at home um, in the privacy of their own home. And so... That's why I mentioned earlier the closet racists are coming out because now yeah. you're able to start seeing because if you're at home and you're doing this and, and you're talking bad about people, but in person, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're the greatest employee ever. Yeah, I don't buy that. That's not how you truly feel because your actions don't show that. And Susie, you asked if, um, if we agree whether or not people who say we should abolish police forces. Um, I don't believe that the police forces should be abolished per se, but I think that they need to be overhauled um, and, and more restorative justice type programs, community type programs should be instituted. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I'm not sure even how that's going to look like. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some, somebody has to protect and serve. So um, I'm not sure how that's work. Yeah, to that I mean, that's, I'd be interested to see how that works though. Throwing the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. so to speak. You know? um, no, I mean to your point, Mary. I think it's uh, uh, again. I'm not. I'm not an expert on criminal justice. Uh, you know, I don't think any of us are. You know, at least at the level that we would need to be. Um, it feels like the answer. I mean, somebody said it in in the comments, and it's so true. You know, he and or maybe it was you, Mary. If we look at this specific instance, in this specific instance, it tends to follow the pattern. People knew the guy was a racist. Mm -hmm. And so it's not abolish the police force. It's, it's dismantle the system that protected him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, I don't know about you guys. Raise your hand if you believe that uh, you that you if you believe that police officers should be held to a higher standard than the population as a whole. I, I do. My hand's off screen. I don't know. It's, it's a problem with having three people on here. You know. um, to me, what that means is um, if you find that a police officer posted something, you know, and used the N-word three years ago on social media, he doesn't get to be a police officer. I'm not saying he can't go start a business or that he needs to be, you know, we need to like kill the guy or put him in prison or, you know, that's not what we're saying. Um, he just doesn't get to be a police officer. He doesn't get to be in the military. He doesn't get to be a firefighter. He doesn't get to work for the government, you know, basically. Um, if, you know, if there's a review and, and, you know, he has a history of being, you know, rougher with minorities than, than white people, he doesn't get to be a police officer anymore. And I think that's the answer. And, I don't, you know, how we address that from a standpoint of, like, police unions and, um, you know, government oversight, I personally think the answer is actually pay police officers more. 
so we can be more selective. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, that would be a, I think it's a solution. I could be wrong, but, um, you know, I think there are things there where I think are probably more the answer. I know getting way off down that tangent, but that's, that's in my opinion, you know, what the answer is. It's like, Hey, how about we don't have racist cops? Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, at least as far as the police goes. Yeah. Um, so, so guys, as we, as we kind of wrap up, um, I'm going to throw this question out there. Is there a question I haven't asked you guys that I should, that either I should be asking you or other people should be asking you? I'm, I'm going to ask you to maybe answer both of those questions. Uh, Brian, I'll go with you first. Is there a question I should be asking you that I haven't asked? Um, I, I Just for people who are, I guess, business owners, I guess, is that, I guess is sort of our platform. Yeah. I, I think, like I said in my, my broadcast last week, on my show that we shouldn't miss this moment. So do you, do you think that there are some people out here that are missing the moment right now? And I, because of one, one reason or another, maybe because of their, because of their, because of their, what their money might be missing afterwards, <laughs> might lose customers or, or whatever. Do you think that uh, just in the people that you know in, in your, in your circles, Matt, do you think that there are people who are missing the moment at this very time? I'm not addressing that. Sadly, I think there's people who are missing the moment now, but they're going to continue to miss it for the rest of their lives. Mm. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular because people would have said the same thing about me just you know a few short weeks ago. I was missing, you know, the opportunity to do something positive. I was, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, I was somebody who was making it worse by not making it better. You know, and what's the old, uh, it's not Edmund Morris, but uh, old, old guy that said, you know, all that's necessary for evil to exist in the world is for good men to do nothing. Um, somebody said that. <laughs> you know, some old dead guy from I think, back in like the 1600s said that. And if somebody knows or can or or has the uh, this this website called Google handy uh, and can look up who said that quote, please uh, let me know. Um, but um, you know, if if you think about that, I mean, we look at like, you know, the. I feel like with um, with racism in America, you know, since 1865. It hasn't been like the Holocaust, where we looked at something and went, oh my gosh, 11 million people in four years. And it was, you know, it's it's vomit inducing, you know, and we we fought it, you know, and people there in Germany, you know, if you've ever read the, the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's, it's, I mean, it's fascinating to, to learn the um edmund burke thank you susie to to learn the the, the links to which people went to to fight against evil mm -hmm. you know sacrificing their own lives you know many of those 11 million people were people who were trying to fight against it you know they weren't uh, they weren't just jewish i think six million of the 11 million were jewish at least five million other people you know um but it's never looked like that in america because it's just been so it's been so systemic and it's been so just, it's kind of always there, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, one person here, one person there. And I'm not saying that's how I feel. I'm just saying that's what, yeah. from a macro level, that's what it's looked like. Yeah. Um, human nature tells me, you know, I know, I know quite a few people who are not only going to miss this moment, but they're going to miss the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. And they're going to die with a lot of hatred in their hearts. I have people like that in my family, you know. Um, and those people I'm are going to keep me up hope. I'm just saying that I'm a student of human psychology, and some of those people are going to die that way. And those people, if they're parents, unfortunately, they're going to raise their children to do the same exact thing. And so mm -hmm. the cycle is going to continue to perpetuate itself. When my daughter was, I want to say, five or six years old, we were living in Alaska. And she came home crying one day from school because she said, Mommy, so-and-so said that they can't come to my party because I'm Black. I was floored. 
absolutely forward because I never thought that I would have to have those kind of conversations with my own children, especially being military. You know, we move all over the place. We're surrounded by every ethnicity and race or, you know, different people. It's beautiful. But for her to tell me that her friend had told her she couldn't come to the house because she was black, mm. I was devastated. I was devastated for my daughter. And, you know, my daughter's 26 years old and she still remembers that moment. I forgot about it. But mm. she reminded me about it two weeks ago when she sat on my bed crying about, what do I tell my own children, mom? I'm, I don't know what to say to them anymore. I still remember when I was five and this happened and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And that's when I realized I've been complicit. I've not been doing the part that I'm supposed to do to make sure that, you know, my children, my grandchildren understand that, you know, people are people. We, we love all people and we treat everybody with respect and dignity because at the end of the day, I don't care if you're black, white, purple, green, yellow, orange, everybody deserves dignity and respect. Hmm. So I want to acknowledge um, something that uh, I saw in the comments there. And I want to ask you that same question, um, Mary, which is what, which question have I not asked that I should be asking? But um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with uh, what Floyd said, you know, that's uh, continued awareness. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Darren points out, and it's so funny. He says, um, you know, nobody is born average or different. And, and Darren, I almost wore my nobody is born average t-shirt that you sent me a while back today. Uh, I almost wore that. I'll just tell you the reason why I didn't. There's just, for some reason there's a big wrinkle right here and it like poofs out and it looks weird. So I didn't wear that. Um, this is the way I folded it. But anyway, this is a side note. Almost wore that today. That would have been too cool. Um, yeah. I mean, better training in, in the community involvement. Uh, I definitely think that's true of, uh, of police officers, and I think that that um, you know, like I said, I just think that they have to be the best of us. I think they have to be the best of us. Um, so that said, um, Mary, is there a question that I I just haven't asked um, that I should be asking of, of either of you, or just uh, I should either be asking of you or of myself or of, of others? I would go back to what I just talked about with the children. What are you doing to educate your children so that they so that they know about inclusivity and diversity in their world? Yeah, that's something we're doing um, slowly. <laughs> and uh, the you know, we had this conversation last week when I told you, you know, like we go to a, what would be defined as a multicultural church. Uh, I realize again, a narrow here. So a, it's just hard to do a multicultural church. Um, I'm an animated speaker and, you know, not, nothing, I can do anything over here and nothing actually happens. Uh, you know, roughly um, 40% of, of our church doesn't look like me, you know, and that's what our kids have grown up in. And I think, you know, the thing for me is, I, I said to you guys, I feel like, you know, by going to a multicultural church, we like checked it, you know, we checked the box, right? Um, you know, like, look, look, what, look at us, you know? Um, but none of the, the prejudices and none of the uh, just ignorance that I had went away because we went to a multicultural, you know, we go to a multicultural church. They just, they just were still there, you know. Um, none of those disappeared just because of that. But our kids, because of being there from birth, they're having a different experience than what I grew up with. Mm. You know, I told you guys, I can still name the black kid in my middle school. Is that McCullough? I can still name him. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're experiencing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, so adding the conversations is definitely, uh, you know, a great next step. So thank you. Um, so tell us real quick, I, this is kind of weird. We're going to do this in complete reverse order. Thank you to whoever said, who in the heck are these people earlier? <laughs> you know, like, do you even tell us about them? Um, 
real quickly, Brian, tell us about uh, you and what you do when you're not doing Facebook lives about, um, you know, about race relations with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm the newly found founder of the um, Authority Business Academy right on Facebook. Uh, we talk about um, adding, developing your authority so you can sell what you're great at. So consequently, I've also had a show myself called the Authority Project. And we, we dealt with these issues as well. We'll be, we have a guest, either myself or guest on that help you build your, your business in a more impactful way. So you can see me there on Facebook or just see me anywhere with Brian S. Arnold. Brian with a Y. So that's me. Yep. <laughs> Brian with a Y. I put it on the screen there so everybody knows. Brian with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold, and it's also Mary with a Y, yes. isn't it? <laughs> Mary with a Y. Yes. Um, Mary, you know, you shared a little bit earlier, but tell us just real quick about uh, about you and, and who you are and where people can find okay. you. Okay, so I'm I'm also doing a lot on Facebook and, and transitioning some to LinkedIn as well. But I, like I mentioned earlier, I work with people that are experiencing um, currently or they have experienced some type of workplace discrimination and they want to change because too often. You know, you stay in work in a job because you're just you're miserable, but you have to because that's your form of pay. That's your security. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to kind of guide people to to understand that they can change their circumstances and their perceptions of what's going on to make it a better place. And I also run um, Women Who Think Big, which is a, a group on Facebook where I work with women who want to think big, play big, grow big and learn big. You know, we all have ideas, we all have dreams and passions, but as women, we put them aside to follow somebody else's dreams and passions. So just kind of want to bring them back to this is what you are capable of doing. And, you know, it's okay to follow your dream. Well, I just want to commend you both. You guys are pumping out a lot of content. Uh, you're taking massive action. Yes. And I, it's so fun. <laughs> it's so fun to watch the two of you. Um, it's, uh, I, I mean, I know what it's like to be there, you know, it's not like it was that long ago <laughs> and, um, and it, it's just so fun to see that what you guys are doing. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you for being on today. I'm going to end with something that, uh, Susie just said here. Um, I also think that we in the white community need to keep, keep, keep each other accountable to not let George Floyd's death in the aftermath be the end of the conversation. Absolutely. This isn't a 50 year thing. Mm -hmm. This may be a 50 year event, but it can't be a 50, you know, this isn't the civil rights act passes and we all go take a nap, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I've been pacing myself, you know, like yeah. it's exactly why one of the reasons I said, you know what, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And if I try to read every book that, you know, um, oh, what's the guy, Ibrahim Ibr X, uh, K, against the K, cannot think of his last name. Um, if I try to read every book he's written mm. and read, you know, the autobiogra autobiography of Malcolm X and all of MLK's letters in one week, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to quit. And you're going to get depressed. Because again, <laughs> that's Nate, yes, this is human psychology. That how we change this system is how we change individuals, and we, you know, we use, like we use human psychology to our advantage. Mm -hmm. I think every movement, if they're ever going to succeed, they've got to understand Robert Cialdini. Mm -hmm. They've got to understand, um, you know, these these movements and how movements have worked in the past. And like she says, we must keep the conversation going and act when we know when it's time to act, um, even. If it may not be the perfect thing to do, we'll make mistakes, but doing nothing is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'll end with just what I said at the beginning um, to everyone. This is, uh, you know, uh, first of all, again, like Susie said, thank you, Brian and Mary, for being here. Um, you know, thank you, Brian and Mary, Darren. Um, this is uh, this is like a very, very first step. Mm -hmm. It's a continuation of many steps before this, no doubt, but it's a first step. And I would just say, uh, I know for me that number 381 is just kind of a mantra. It doesn't mean that on day 103, you know, 382, I, <laughs> you know, do whatever. Um, but like, let's see this out. 
Like, what is something that you, and I'm speaking specifically to, to white people, um, what is something that you can do for the next 381 days? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is for you. I mean, it. there are a lot of things, and we've talked about a lot of them today. But what is something you can commit to for 381 days? And then okay, take a day off on 382, then start a new 381. <laughs> you know, but just commit to it. You know, for them, it was walking. It was carpet. Like, they were committed to that one thing. And I believe if it had gone 681, they'd have done it. If it had gone 991, they would have done it. Um, so just find that thing that you can commit to. It doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the world, but find something you can commit to. And um, I'll leave you with one tip that we're doing. Um, and then just have conversations. Just you talk to people, you know, just like we did today. So Mary, Brian, again, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. See you guys. Bye.